the UK's biggest lake and the toxic tide that's killing pets, livestock, wildlife and even threatening human health. Welcome to the show and welcome back after our summer hiatus. It doesn't feel like summer anymore, I must say, with a brisk wind blowing off the body of water here. This is Loch Ney in Northern Ireland, the UK's biggest inland water body, and it's terribly polluted. We'll be looking at why and what can be done about it a bit later. Also on the show, we've heard about lab-grown meat. Would you eat lab-grown animal fat? we go to the UK's first cultivated fat farm and hear how they think it will revolutionise the taste of meat substitutes. As Rishi Sunak backs off on the pace of net zero, turning it into a political hot potato, we look ahead to the party conference season to see what we might expect. And Prince William announces finalists for this year's Earthshot Prize, including two from Britain. We'll hear about how one of them is hoping to clean the air with a new type of tyre. But first to the lock behind me, we're going to show you this toxic scum, ask what's caused it and can it be saved? Here on the edge of Loch Ney, the blue-green algae is coming in waves, building up to a toxic, gloopy blanket. Well, I'll tell you what, it stinks. The loch is dying, smothered in toxic scum that's dangerous for humans and deadly for wildlife. But how has this happened? This is affluent. Loch Ness has been used as a toilet. This year, it's the scale of the algae that's unprecedented, not just covering much of the loch, itself the size of the Isle of Wight, but also flowing out to contaminate beaches. Too much of what's excreted by farm animals and to a lesser extent us humans seeps into rivers and flows into the loch. You can visualise it through a slurry tank being emptied into a river that goes into Loch Ness. Mm -hmm. That feeds the algae. The algae in turn grow in very prolific numbers. They suck the oxygen out of the water and they start feeding themselves to the point that it becomes frenetic. It becomes a toxic soup. In the last decade, there's been a huge deliberate expansion in livestock farming, with more cattle, pig numbers growing from 480,000 in 2013 to 738,000 in 2022, and over a million more chickens in the same period. The urine and dung from all those animals is worsening pollution. Campaigners say farmers have too much political influence with damaging results. There is virtual immunity to major polluters in Northern Ireland. That's why a number of years ago, the United Kingdom Environmental Law Association described Northern Ireland as a dirty corner of the UK. And when you don't have a government, and when many people believe it was the government that created the context for this pollution in the first place, people are thinking about what to do in the future. We both felt that very little of anything was being done to address and to control the situation. The pollution has got so bad this year, people have had enough and this protest meeting is packed. We're hurt, we're, we're upset, you know, that this is happening. Such a, a horrid state that the rivers and waterways have become. My husband fishes locally and he can't continue. It seems a real disaster, but what's causing it's another problem. They're blaming farmers, but I don't think it's the farmers. What's happening now is very special and very interesting. I haven't seen it in a lifetime of campaigning in Northern Ireland. What we're seeing now is a thriving, ecosystem of local communities coming together. Scientific research suggests that while some of the pollution originates from human sewage treatment, nearly two-thirds of the phosphate, the main cause of the blue-green algae, is coming from farms. And not far off half the province's farmland drains into Loch Ness. When cows or other livestock are out in the field, their dung and urine drops on the grass. Now that can cause pollution problems itself, but often they're housed for at least six months a year in sheds, and then their waste is dropped indoors and must be collected. And it often ends up somewhere like this, a giant slurry tank. And then it gets piped into these. These are what farmers call digesters. They are in effect 
big stomachs and the slurry spends about 56 days in there and it separates it out between methane, a gas that they want for fuel, and digestate, something that can be spread on the fields as a fertiliser. This is where they store the gas. It does actually say biogas on the side of it. And it's become quite a significant fuel for farmers and they also want to actually put it into the grid. But what we're interested in is what happens to that digestate, the stuff that ends up on the fields and is still part of the pollution problem. And this is a pile of it here. It's been slightly dried, this stuff, and slightly compressed, but this nevertheless is digestate. But at this government-backed research farm, they're developing ways to separate the harmful phosphate from the more useful fertiliser. So what we're doing here is we have a very slow turning screw in the middle covered with a screen around it which is porous. We pump, in this case, digestate into the front end of the separator. It's pushed down the screw and eventually as we start to get a solid build up at the bottom end of the screw we get a back pressure and that back pressure then pushes more of the solid material to this end and pushes the liquid out through the screens and then this goes to a storage tank and that's what's spread on the fields with a reduced phosphorus content in it. And the phosphate rich solid byproduct could have a use too. In the front we have a bucket of the separated liquid. It's been through the mechanical separation process where we're looking at. That then is reapplied to fields with a much lower phosphorus content. Gotcha. We have the separated solid material which has been dried and then we have pelleted that material. Um, compared that in combustion trials to commercial wood pellets and it has 90% of the energy value which is really encouraging. So if farms across Northern Ireland, livestock farms, were to adopt this kind of technology with this kind of separation, what impact could it have? We could see a huge reduction in the phosphorus loss to water and a big impact on water quality, a very positive impact. So it could really help to clean up Loch Ness and other water bodies? Correct. The group representing farmers, the Ulster Farmers Union, declined to talk to us, but farmers also blame the algae on sewage leaks and extreme weather. Climate change is worsening the toxic blooms, Average Loch Ney temperature has increased by one degree since 1995 and this year's weather, hot June and wet July, favoured algal growth. But campaigners and scientists agree that this is essentially a man-made problem and a big one. Loch Ney is the heartland of Northern Ireland. If this was in England, this would be such a massive story that you couldn't get to the House of Commons. There'd be so many outraged people outside. Well, on that note, because this is such a massive issue, I want to discuss it more with some people who know this patch really well. And that's David Blevins, Sky's senior island correspondent, and Shauna Kaur, who's environment correspondent for the Mirror Group here in Ireland. Shauna, I'm going to start with you. I mean, it, it matters to the lake, it matters to water, it matters to pollution, but it goes wider than that, doesn't it? It does. This is an issue that impacts across society, and that's what's really interesting about it. Never has there been an issue that's brought so many people together. We have fishers impacted by this. Loch Ness Rescue isn't able to do their job. We have people that have lost jobs, people that have fallen ill, people aren't able to walk their dogs around the lake. Tourist industry is impacted. We've had some businesses have to close their doors. And the water supply to much of Northern Ireland as well? Yeah, 40% of Northern Ireland gets its water from Loch Ness. That's 460,000 homes. And, you know, Northern Ireland water also has sewage going into this lake as well with, through 56 effluent outfall pipes and 72 storm overflows. I spoke with an expert at Ulster University, a freshwater expert, about a month ago and he said it's a crazy situation where we've got you know, our water company polluting the same lake that it's also taken 40% of our water from. So it's taking the water from the toilet as we heard it was called yeah. earlier on. Uh, David, people have talked about this as partly the result of the sort of political vacuum in Northern Ireland. Can you talk us through that a bit for those that don't know it so well? Yes, there is currently no devolved government in Northern Ireland because the DUP is boycotting power sharing over the post-Brexit trading arrangements. And that is impacting on all aspects of life. And this is the latest crisis, I think, that is illustrating that political stalemate we have in Northern Ireland. There is no environment minister, so therefore there is no one really to take the lead on bringing toge together the multi-agency task force that would be required to uh, address this kind of a problem. And, and I've heard 
some suggestion that this is such a crisis that it should prompt the, the, the recreation, the recall of a parliament in Northern Ireland. Any chance? Well, the SDLP, one of the nationalist parties, is uh, in the process of trying to have a petition to recall the Northern Ireland Assembly so that an environment minister could be appointed, but that would require the DUP to change its position. They haven't done that so far and they're not likely to. So that really is just an effort to put pressure on the DUP, using this to put pressure on the DUP. To, to, to come back into office, but equally the DUP will use this to apply the pressure to the British government to remove the trade border in the Irish Sea. So that, so that we can get going again, yeah. Um, we talked in the film that we made about the, the, the power of, of farmers. Yes, there is clearly some responsibility from farming for what's happening here, but farming does seem to have quite a powerful grip on uh, Northern Irish politics. Perhaps you could explain why and how. It really does across the board. It's a very widely rural area, you know, um, so from nationalist parties to, to unionist parties, you've, you've You've got that pressure always coming through when you're speaking to MLAs and they always seem to do right by the farmer. You've also got the massive lobbying power that the Ulster, Ulster Farmers Union is. And, and on top of that, then you've got the huge uptake in agri-food businesses. And that, that, I think, feeds directly into what has happened here because in 2012 we had two ministers when there was power sharing you know, come up with a plan to um, massively increase growth in the agricultural sector. That saw sales move from four billion a year to five billion a year. And now we're looking at the results of that. You know, the department that oversees our environment position admits itself that 51% more phosphorus has poured into the lock since 2012 when that plan went into place. But, but also subsequently to that, we've now got a green growth strategy, which Northern Ireland Environment Agency, even last year, advised the department, we're worried about this. It's, it's going to make it really, really difficult for us to, to keep our rivers and lakes and get them up to good quality status. I mean, David, for those that, that once again don't live here, I mean, explain how in Northern Ireland, when it comes to farming and environment, the, the balance is quite different from the rest of the United Kingdom. I think it's best illustrated by the fact that Northern Ireland is light years behind the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of environmental legislation. And whatever little legislation there is there, they're very slow uh, to implement. And that is because no matter which seat you hold in the Northern Ireland Assembly, you will have a significant number of farmers within your constituency. And, and I think you told me it doesn't actually have environmental protection legislation legislation in the same way? Or it was very late to the table in terms of environmental legislation and, and then of course we entered this period of political stalemate so therefore there's no chance of that seriously being enforced. And, and just a, a very quick one from both of you, people have talked you know up with this we will no longer put, something's going to change now, do you think it actually will briefly Shauna? I hope it will but I think massive public pressure is going to help on that front, I've never seen an issue unite so many parts of society. Yeah, and David, I know you like to kayak on the on the waters behind us. Will you be getting in your boat soon because it'll be cleaner? Well, the Belfast Telegraph described this as a, a, an issue of biblical proportions. It's going to take a biblical miracle, I think, to sort it out in time for me to be back on the water anytime soon. David, Shana, thank you very much indeed. Well, we're going to go to a break now. And when we come back, we'll be chewing the fat on an extraordinary week in the environment, in British politics, and also we might be taking a bite out of some lab-grown fat. Would you do that? Welcome back to the show. Now, despite the hype, sales of alternative meat products have stalled in recent years. But now a lab in London thinks they can change that. Mickey Carroll has more. This is the UK's first lab-grown fat laboratory. The scientists here are growing fat to use in alternative meat. The idea is to make things like soy burgers and seitan sausages much more appealing to people who currently eat a lot of meat. What they're growing here in Hoxton isn't like pork fat, it is pork fat. In the same way a lab-grown steak is made by growing the cells that make up a steak, the team here do the same thing with a pig. So it all starts from the live pig, from which we take a small sample. Once we've taken that sample, we don't have to go back to the pig again. Then we grow the cells, so it's about understanding 
what they like to grow, so what temperature, what food they want, they need oxygen, and making their environment for it. Once we're happy with the number of cells we have, we turn them into fat cells, and then they start picking up fat and becoming juicier and rounder. And when we're happy with the product, we harvest it and we have real animal fat. So here are cells at the beginning of the process. Uh, so you can see that each elongated shape is a stem cell, and then they're going to grow and cover the surface of the plate. And then they're slowly going to turn fatter and fatter, and this is what they look like once uh, they're fat cells. So you can see lipid droplets. By 2040, some experts are predicting that lab-grown meat will make up 35% of global meat consumption. The next 40% would be conventional meat, and the remaining 25 vegan meat alternatives. The team here in Hoxton are hoping that the fat they're growing in this laboratory will make meat alternatives much tastier. Fat makes meat juicy, rich and tender, but if you're eating an alternative meat burger, where do you get that juicy fat from? Chef Josh is making a plant-based pork belly with real pork fat. In usual plant-based formulations and products, you have a lot of palm oil and you have a lot of coconut oil and it just doesn't have that flavour. You know, the thing I'm after as a chef is flavour, like number one. And, and it's the thing that's missing from all of these products. But there are big hurdles to overcome before we're all crunching on crackling grown in Petri dishes. Growing food in this way is a lot more expensive than conventional farming. When the first cultivated burger was presented in 2013, it cost more than £200,000. Now the price has dropped to around £7 for a burger, but that's still a lot more expensive than something you'd buy in the supermarket. Initially, the cost of things like cultivated meat and products containing cultivated fat might be higher than um, a, a burger or a sausage that, that you buy in the supermarket. But over time, that will change. Um, what, what we make is, is made in a really efficient way. Um, it has plenty of other benefits, but in terms of cost specifically, we'll manage to reduce the cost um, down to below the cost of eating traditional meat. But that's not the only problem. One of the main reasons people might switch from conventional meat to a meat alternative is because of the impact of intensive farming on the environment. But a recent study by scientists in California questions the green credentials of cultivated meat products. In fact, they say in some cases, cultivated meat could be 25% worse in terms of greenhouse gas emissions compared to a conventionally farmed cow. What we need to understand here is that it's not necessarily better for the environment, that it's not a given that cultivated meat is better for the environment. It has to be designed into the production. The scientists here say their product reduces emissions by 80 to 90%. And while the lab-grown meat industry is still new, you could soon be tucking into a Sunday roast marbled with lab fat. Mickey Carroll, Sky News. There have been shockwaves in the politics of climate and environment in the UK this week, no doubt about that. And as we approach the party conference season, we're going to hear what all the parties have up their sleeves or on the table. And to start with, we're hearing about the Liberal Democrats from our politics and business correspondent, Mari Aurora. This week, the Prime Minister has watered down green pledges. Now, he says it's not about politics, it's all about the long-term vision for the country. But realistically, this is always about politics. Now, the Tory party is almost 20 points behind in the polls, so they've got to do something pretty radical to try and close that gap between themselves and the Labour Party. But also, let's not forget the by-election in South Rysip and Uxbridge. Now, that was won by the Conservatives on a platform against the ULES, against the old ultra low emission zone expanding out into London. But also let's not forget this weekend kicks off conference season and this week is the opportunity for the Lib Dems to try and show their vision for the future of net zero. Now the Lib Dems so far have successfully won by-elections on platforms around the environment especially sewage in our waterways and our rivers. But also, conference is a season where all political parties can really try to paint a picture of their vision of Britain under their rule. One thing we know for sure is we won't be seeing seven bins outside Downing Street anytime soon. When it comes to pollution from vehicles, a lot of us think about what comes from the exhaust, but in fact, a lot of dangerous particles actually come from these, the tyres, but now a British company thinks it may have found a way 
to reduce that. And they're in line for an Earthshot prize. That's a million pound potentially award that's backed by Prince William for kind of environment and climate solutions. And I'm pleased to say that the company behind this is Enso and uh, their founder, uh, G. Erlandson, joins me from New York. Um, G, um, tell me, what do your tyres do that's better than a conventional tyre? So we at Enzo make better tires for electric vehicles. And principally, we do two things. We extend the range of electric cars by making them more energy efficient. That means you can go further driving your vehicle and you charge it less often. At the same time, we also make our tires highly durable. This reduces the microplastic pollution. That's the particles that come off the tire. Uh, that impacts the air pollution in particular, but also uh, microplastic pollution globally and people don't often know this but when you drive and accelerate brake or turn you're generating this fine harmful dust and it's really important that we start talking about this because it's not uh fully really known all the science behind it but we know it's impactful on our planet and this is really why we at enzo have developed basically a better tire to tackle this problem and these can be these, these PM 2.5s and PM 10s that people have heard about that can get into lungs? Yeah, absolutely. PM 2.5s, PM 10s, but also even smaller particles and some bigger particles. It basically goes to the whole spectrum of particle size. What's important to note here is that we're breathing more tire dust than tailpipe dust. So this means effectively that currently, the exposure to our human health and the environment is actually greater from when it comes to air pollution in particular from tires than tailpipes or exhaust pipes as we call them in the uk but what's the the technology that, that you that you've used fundamentally there are different aspects number one we use higher grade raw materials to make our tires and they can deliver some of these performances but it's also how we combine these materials the chemistry between them where we have also some key innovations. Then when, of course, we design these particularly for electric vehicles around the particular use case. So we've already now selling them to London taxis. Uh, just briefly, what would winning an Earthshot prize mean for you? Uh, of course, it would be an amazing uh, experience to win it for Enzo. And of course, the, the money would help us to put more tires on the roads quicker, particularly to tackle air pollution and microplastic pollution uh, faster. But I think the more important thing is really the awareness. If we are able to raise the subject of tire pollution, that I think would be the biggest award we could have because people don't talk about this. And also today, there are almost no regulations anywhere globally that combat this pollution. Well, that's it for this week. Remember, you can catch up on all your environment and climate news on the Sky News website and app or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And I'm pleased to say we'll be back next week.